effective and needed in today's tech world. All that with our today guest, David Summerfleck. So how are you, David? I'm very well, thank you. So David, can you tell us more about your journey? Sure. Well, basically, uh, I've been in the digital marketing field for over 20 years. Um, I started in the mid 90s, uh, working for different marketing and advertising agencies, and um, went from being a copywriter to a web developer, web designer, studying SEO, content marketing, and coordinating all the different aspects of marketing so that um, all the different aspects could work in unison to promote a business online and also offline as well. Because in the mid 90s, the internet, it was relatively new. So I was one of the few copywriters at the time who was very familiar with putting together websites that would work on you know, just about every type of device. And back then we didn't have Google, we had Yahoo and Excite and a few other search engines like Alta Vista and everything. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a little bit different. That's really interesting. I still remember the Yahoo days. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was very different. And, um, most business owners at that time thought that the internet was a fad, that it was something for children or for just playing games or something. So they really didn't take it seriously. And now the great irony is that here we are in 2021, still with the pandemic going on, and many small businesses who really need to reach more consumers the most, many still have that same perspective with internet marketing that it's a fad, it's something that only children do, or I can get by without it. I can use from um, a free template and hire a, some teenager to figure it out or what have you. So many of them are still taking that same approach. And it's very unfortunate because it's so competitive out there today. That's so true. Especially so, with COVID, you know, if you have a business and you don't deliver services to someone's home, or if you if you are not prepared to have video conferencing, or deliver your items to someone's home with e commerce, or if you're you can't be found in Google, then your business is really going to be losing money on a daily basis. That's so true. So how did the passion of marketing started? Well, for me, when I was in college, I studied writing with the goal of being a writer. I studied Shakespeare and, and Chaucer and Keats and medieval journalism and um, Latin American journal, um, literature. And so my goal was to be a writer. And while I had internships working at different agencies and newspapers at a very young age, I realized that there weren't that many positions in the area that I lived in. So that's when I began to study website development and web design much more seriously with the goal of being more proficient in that. And so I've always been someone who's um, really enjoyed digital marketing, but also reading the classics work, classic works of literature and trying to be as literary as I can. That's really interesting. So you're a business, you are a small business mentor. How do you mentor business people? And is there any tips that you give them? 
owner or a freelancer for that matter, what I do is first we schedule one or two video conference calls to make sure that we are a good fit for each other because that's, of course, very important. We have to make sure that we're in agreement with the terms uh, before we can even begin working with each other. My job is to help the business owner or the freelancer work out their problems. They want to make sure that um, they can achieve the value and achieve the goals that they want to reach. So first, we have at least one or two conversations to make sure that we are a good fit for each other. And then after that, uh, the number of calls and what we discuss, to a great deal that depends on the person and what issues they're facing in life and in business. As far as tips for the average business owner, my primary advice would be to work from a very thought out business plan. And a business plan should include your marketing budget based on your annual income. And this is very easy to tell what it should be because the United States Small Business Administration has documented what your investment range should be in marketing if your goal is to reach more customers. Roughly, that's 10% of your gross annual revenue. You set that aside for marketing. So, of course, part of that is having a professional online presence that can rank on the first page of Google search results, probably locally. You want to have intelligent, entertaining content written for who your ideal consumers are. You want to make sure that you have a presence on uh, YouTube and maybe a podcast. And all of these things require organization before you begin. Because you have to know who are you trying to communicate with first before you just start going crazy and, and trying to produce so much content. That's, you know, you want to make sure that you know what you're doing and why you're doing it before you start. And it may sound very simple, but most business owners don't do that. They will just start and then wonder why no one is calling them. Or they'll go get a free do-it-yourself website, but then wonder why no one is emailing them and no one is calling them and nothing's really happening. So it's very, very important to have a foundation first where you have planned who you're trying to reach, why you're trying to reach them, who is a professional who you want to work with to help you structure these goals and make sure that you're doing everything correctly because there's so many different parts involved in marketing in general. That's so true. So during this pandemic, most businesses can transferred into the online business to save their company. How can digital marketing help the, those business owners? Well, most businesses statistically did mm -hmm. not transition into online business models. So the failure rate statistically for the average small business is extremely high, 95 to 98% of all, of all small businesses in the US would fail within their first two to three years very quickly. Now with COVID-19, the failure rate for businesses is much higher because you have the pre-existing problems that were there before, but now you have a global pandemic that many people still do not believe is real or very confused uh, by and they don't know how to handle it. So it would be nice if all businesses transitioned to online business models in the wake of this. But the reality is that those businesses who were already prepared before COVID came are the ones that are doing okay now. So all businesses should have a way 
to work with their customers or their clients remotely, meaning online. Whether you own a restaurant or a legal practice, a doctor's office, a shoe repair a service, a mechanic, whatever it is, you should be prepared already to have a way to communicate with your customers or clients remotely through video conferencing. You should have a way, you should have had a way to do this beforehand. And obviously now it's even more serious. So for example, I had a doctor's appointment this morning. We talked uh, via video conferencing. He asked me a few questions. Everything is fine. If you need a prescription refill, we can talk through Zoom or what have you. The prescription can be refilled remotely. If I need groceries, I can use Instacart, have groceries delivered to my front door. Um, there's even services in many states within the U.S. where they'll come and fill up your gas tank so you don't have to go to a gas station and worry about people coming too close. So every business should have some way that is thought out and organized for them to deliver their services remotely. And as things get better six months from now, then you can slowly transition. But there will be people who will still want to have things delivered to your, their home or services provided remotely or without direct contact. Uh, so I don't believe that that's going to go away. So if it's a grocery store or restaurant, you should have a way to deliver your food to people's homes. If you provide a service like shoe repair or making clothing or what have you, or jewelry, you should have a way to do that remotely where people can send you in their measurements. Then you can deliver the item to their home or mail it to them or what have you. You know, people can download things, they can communicate by video, they can communicate by audio, the, techno the technology is there. And really, quite honestly, the technology has been there for the last 10 years. We had video conferencing at least 10 years ago with Skype, if not longer. But people didn't want to do it because they were so used to doing everything in person. If you wanted to meet, you would get in the car and go to the coffee shop. Now you should ask yourself, is this cost effective with traffic and the price of gas and you have to order food, food when you go meet someone? It was never cost effective before, but now you also have to concern yourself with, is this worth, worth uh, risking my health over? So all of these considerations should be taken seriously if they were not before. And the technology is there. And also, I would say that really, quite honestly, it's too much for one person to do by themselves. So that's where you would want to work with a professional if you have a business that is focused on generating profit. That's so true. Um, we must consider all the risk and be ready for the change. That's what the pandemic has taught us. Yes. So what are some common social media marketing mistakes business make? Well, I would say that one of the most common mistakes is simply not knowing who your ideal customer or consumer is. Well, why does that matter? because you need to know who you're trying to communicate with before you try to go and communicate with them. So for example, if we look at um, going to a business networking event, if your goal is to simply meet another human, you can do that. But if your goal is to have a business and reach more potential customers, well, you have to know what types of business customers or consumers would be most interested in what you provide. So you can't say just any human being, well, they may not have any money. They may not have a job. 
They may not want what you can provide for them. They may not see the value in what you could do for them. So you could be wasting your time. So it's very important to know who you're trying to reach and why. What what um, pain do they experience that you can help them solve? So I think that's very important. And the second issue is to have that content already prepared. When I first started, I would promote content through social media. And then I realized after a month or so that, you know, I really don't have much content to distribute. I really don't. I have maybe 10 or 15 blog posts, maybe 10 uh, blog uh, I'm sorry, maybe 10 or 15 blog posts that I've written, maybe 10 podcasts that I had been on at that time, maybe a few videos. So I really didn't have a lot of content to distribute or offer to consumers at that time. So I had to take a step back and say, wait a minute, I jumped in too quickly. I did what I tell other people not to do. So I stopped and said, okay, you need to give yourself 90 days to write more blog posts, to be a guest on more podcasts, start my own podcast, create more videos, make sure that all of these are as well done as I can make them, but that they also speak to the pain of the consumer uh, so that the, the, the type of business owner who I want to help that the content I produce speaks to the pains that they experience and then can offer to help them with important information. So if you simply produce content that shows you smiling or dancing or being silly or whatever, that's not what business owners want. So it might attract other people who want to look at it, but it's not going to make money. And that's what's really important for business. So talking about content creating, how can you um, attract your clients to your content or your blog? Well, first you need to write it. So I mean, first you need to write the content. And after you do that, you want to have at least three or four, I would probably say four is probably the limit. You want to have external links to authoritative websites. In other words, other websites associated to what you do or related to what you do that are listed on the first page of Google search results. So those are called authoritative links. So you want to make sure that your content is well written and created intelligently with care and concern so that it can really appeal to them. You could have 50 blog posts, but if you have one well-written blog post, you can use it over and over again on a daily basis. An example of this would be, I have a blog post on my website where I talk about budgeting for digital marketing results. And If I go to Quora or Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter um, or any social media site, I can find questions all day long where people ask, how much is a website? How much is SEO? How much is digital marketing? How much is hosting? How do on and on and on. You can literally find a million of the same questions every day. So you could simply do that and you could repost that same blog post you wrote over and over again all day long if you want to. And just say, if you're interested in actually getting help with someone who can help you, please contact so-and-so. Here's my information. Now, here's the blog post that can help you. So if I have blog posts that help customers with their issues, that's number one. You just repost it and answer people's questions with that. 
And the more you have, the more you can start to automate that so that every day these posts are sent to LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, uh, Quora is very popular, and other social media sites like Pinterest. You know, and if you have an audio podcast, then you could circulate your podcast if you also make that into a video format. When now you have a video podcast that you can also circulate on YouTube and Vimeo and VO and Meta Cafe and Daily Motion and on and on and on and use the authoritative links like we discussed previously, change the hashtags change the title around a little bit. And now it can be used to attract a whole new uh, type of consumer. And this is what we call content repurposing and marketing. That's so cool. So you're an author of two books, The Road of to Digital Marketing Profits and Guide to Digital Marketing. Can you tell us more about your books? Yes. Uh, one book is called The Road to Digital Marketing Profits, which is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, and many, many other uh, book retailers online. And my other book is called The Illustrated Guide to Digital Marketing, which is a little different. It has much more uh, visual imagery. It has uh, infographic images and charts and, and diagrams and visual images of that nature to educate consumers and business owners and also freelancers in how we use digital marketing to grow a business. And it explains key concepts to the readers, such as SEO, content marketing, identifying who your ideal customer should be and how to market to them, what type of content you should write, the role that branding plays in marketing and how that works, e-commerce and design, how you can tell a professional designer from someone who is not, um, how long a typical project should take, how to budget, and all of these types of concepts are in that book as well, but they're explained in a visual way. So that uh, ebook I sell through my own website at dms.blue, just because it's like a graphic novel or comic book in the formatting. That's so interesting. Make sure to check it out, guys. So David is also a host broadcaster at Summer Flick, David Summer Flick Broadcast, where he interviews experts in business innovation, digital marketing culture, and creativity. Can you tell us more about your podcast? Sure, thank you. Uh, my podcast is called the David Summer Flick Podcast, just based on, you know, just named after me. And it basically discusses my areas of expertise, which are, you know, digital marketing, business growth, being a small business mentor, working with nonprofit organizations. But I also wanted to be able to interview people who I thought were very interesting and doing interesting, engaging things. So I also interview people who do things with culture who discuss international relationships and business growth internationally. But I also talk to people who are uh, experts in diversity and inclusion and other aspects of culture. So the goal of that podcast is to provide information for business owners, but also have intelligent, enjoyable conversations with experts in different fields. And you can apply to be a guest for that podcast or submit a question by going to dms.blue slash podcast guest. That's really interesting. So where can they listen to it? Uh, uh, where can they listen to it? Yes. It's carried on Spotify, um, Apple podcasts, 
Google Podcasts. Uh, we're now carried by a podcast service in India. I think it's called Giovan, I think. Um, so basically, uh, just about every podcast provider now uh, will carry my podcast, the David Summerfleck podcast. But the main ones are Spotify, Google Podcasts. Um, what are some of the other ones? Overcast, CastBox, Podcast Addict is a very popular app. Um, so basically, wherever you listen to podcasts, it should be available. Make sure to show some support and listen to his amazing uh, podcast interviews. So what advice will you give to the entrepreneur out there? My advice would be to gain, gain clarity on what your, your business goals are and then separate your goals from what are short-term goals that you need to achieve very quickly and then your long-term goals that where you want to be five years from now and then connect the two. So for example, if you say my goal is to be a millionaire in five years, that's very nice, but you have to also lay the foundation for achieving that goal. And that requires an enormous amount of organization and structure and working with other experts to help you um, build that foundation. Cause obviously you can't do that by yourself. It's too much. So you want to be very clear about your short term and long term goals and what you can do to achieve them and then go about creating what you need to get there. That's such wonderful advice. Thank you. Absolutely. You're very welcome. I appreciate it. So one last question, and I do ask this question at the end of each interview. Um, how do you build a powerful connection? How do you build a business owner wants to make more money? They want to reach more clients or, can, or customers. And of course, that's the case. But the way that we build really powerful, lasting connections is by speaking to people with what really matters to the most. What are they feeling? What are they experiencing in, the li in their lives, in the life of their business? So speak to their pain points and their interests and our common grounds as business owners and human beings all throughout the world. So to build a powerful connection, you want to talk to people about what really matters to them and why does it matter to them the most. Try to identify these causes and then try to legitimately help then you can build from that. And so secondly, after that, I would say is to also think about how we can collaborate and work together as professionals and as people. You know, many times um, if you're on a podcast or you're, you're interviewed on a podcast or if you have your own podcast or a YouTube program, Sometimes the people don't get in touch with you afterwards and say, boy, that was a great podcast. I enjoyed that. Thank you so much. Maybe we could collaborate together and interview someone together. Or, or do you have any other ideas of how we could work together somehow? Or are there ways that we could collaborate and work together? You never, uh, you know, would think that sometimes people would say, yes, they'd be happy to do that. Sometimes people say, I, I don't know how, or they don't have time, or they don't respond. But sometimes people will respond and say, yeah, I'd be happy to do that. And that's how you can build a powerful connection. You know, I've been on maybe 40 or 50 podcasts now. And I would say, maybe four or five of those people have kept in touch with me and we have built friendships where we keep in touch and we communicate regularly, 
we share information, we help each other. So the, the value goes beyond just the one time conversation. And for your customers, if you're a business owner, you have customers, you want to reach out to them and communicate with with them every couple of months, at the very least, check in with them, ask them how business is going. Do they have any problems that you could help them with? I've done that many times. And I've had business owners tell me, well, David, as a matter of fact, I'm getting so much spam email. Can you help me with that? Yes, I can. I'd be happy to help you. Um, here's what I would charge for an hour of looking at this. Could that work for you? Sometimes I'll have other people I know contact me and say, you know, can you help me uh, find more freelance work? And I'll say, sure, I can. Here's what I can offer you or things like that. So you never know where it might be an opportunity for business or to strengthen a relationship. That's truly amazing. So it was an honor to have you. Thanks for joining us and sharing your business wisdom with us. It was really an honor. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And I uh, appreciate your time as well. And keep in touch. Sure. Thank, thanks a lot, David. So okay. guys, make sure to listen to us on Spotify, Anchor, and you can find us on many other platforms as well. See you guys on the next episode.